China is the most populated nation on Earth and home to a booming organ transplant industry. However, over the past decade, reports have emerged that the majority of organs are not sourced from death row prisoners and donations, as stated by officials, but rather from innocent prisoners of conscience murdered on demand. Researchers across the globe are uncovering new evidence that shows the true nature and scale of these abuses. In June 2016, three independent investigators jointly published a 680-page report of irrefutable evidence. China, to my knowledge, is the only country in the world where the government-run industrial program kills people and sells their organs. Endless hospitals in here, we go into them in great detail. We're talking about a large uh, hospital, endless amounts of uh, transplant surgeons and uh, transplant teams. I was really surprised how high the number was. I mean, it's, it, as I say, it's multiple to between six and ten of the official figures. Hearings were held by the U.S. Congress, the British Parliament, the European Parliament, and the Canadian Parliament. The U.S. House of Representatives unanimously passed a resolution condemning the systematic state-sanctioned organ harvesting from non-consenting prisoners of conscience. China's killing for organs is making a major appearance across media outlets all over the world. In 2006, it first came to light that prisoners of conscience were being killed on demand for organ transplants in secret detention facilities throughout China. The first two researchers to investigate were David Kilgore, former Canadian Secretary of State for Asia Pacific, and David Matus, an international human rights lawyer. When we started in 2006, I didn't know where the trials would lead or what the conclusion would be. Uh, the initial surprise and disappointment was that this was true, that it was happening throughout China, and it was happening from 2001 to the date of our report. Kilgore and Matus released their first report in July 2006 and later published the book Bloody Harvest. Around the same time, Ethan Gutman, an independent investigative journalist based in London. He spent seven years doing his own research before publishing The Slaughter in 2014. We made the point that it was really prisoners of conscience we believe are making up the bulk of these organs uh, that are out there. And uh, we came, as David Kilgore and David Matus and I, came to this from very, the same conclusion from very different, uh, using very different uh, procedures. But we did come to that conclusion. The investigators joined forces, researched hundreds of transplant hospitals in China, and released their new report in 2016. The three investigators were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. Discovering exactly how large the transplant industry is in China and how many victims there have been is difficult. The researchers spent a decade piecing together the evidence. For example, in September 2013, Director Zhu Jie of the Liver Transplant Center at the People's Hospital of Peking University told China Economic Weekly, our hospital conducted 4,000 liver and kidney transplants within a particular year. So we had to cross-check everything. Uh, so when we had posted volume numbers, we cross-checked it against staff, against beds, against research publications, against uh, media reports, the, against the purchase of Im immunosuppressive drugs, I mean, every which way we could. And what we were able to do by all this cross-checking is develop a consistent picture. And, and in that particular hit case, we came to the conclusion that yes, this claim of 4,000 was real. Chenjin Central Hospital, they have 500 beds. It's actually over that now. 500 dedicated transplant beds. Now they were claiming in their internal communications at, at several points to be doing 131% occupancy. What that means, again, 20 to 30 day stay, or what it suggests is they're doing about 5,000 transplants per year. 
These examples show that China's official claim of 10,000 transplants per year is easily surpassed by just a few hospitals. But these two hospitals are just the tip of the iceberg. The investigators found that more than 1,000 transplant hospitals applied for permits from the Ministry of Health in 2007 to continue doing transplants. That suggests these hospitals met the ministry's minimum capacity requirement for transplant centers it certifies. 169 were eventually selected. If you assume hospitals just operating at the minimums, never mind actual, our actual estimate is closer to 100,000 a year. The researchers found other evidence of a massive transplant system, some of it from Chinese officials themselves. He Xiaoxun, a member of the expert committee of the Human Organ Donation Commission, stated, the number of transplants increased by 10 times between 1999 and 2000, and further tripled by 2005. That's a 30-fold increase in six years. Wu Meng Chao, known as the father of liver surgery in China, told the media in 2011, China now performs the most liver transplants in the world. Since 2000, the entire United States has performed an average of about 6,000 liver transplants a year. This could be matched by just a few hospitals in China. That they had this endless supply of organs available on demand and the only limit was capacity. And so what you saw after 2001 was this huge building boom. New beds, new wings, new hospitals focused on transplants. And, and so that the volume, it, when the system's operating at capacity, increased year by year. The report shows that just the 169 hospitals approved by the Ministry of Health could have performed over one million transplants since the year 2000. Many more hospitals were also doing transplants despite not having been certified. Organ transplantation has been continuously incorporated into the national five-year plan and has become a high priority in China's national strategy. A large number of organ transplant research and training projects are funded under the major national programs and funds. The investigators found that China International Transplantation Network Assistance Center, SITNAC, listed transplant prices for foreigners on its archived website. It was bringing in about nine or ten billion dollars a year, this, uh, this industrial uh, transplant operation going on across China now. It's a lot of money, a lot of, uh, a lot of hospitals are financing a lot of their activities through that. They're watched very, very closely indeed by the top leadership, so they're fully aware of this. Uh, as well as the fact that Wang Lijun uh, one of the, the Bo Xi Lai, who was a contender for the Chinese presidency. This was his right-hand man. He was the most famous policeman in all of uh, China. Uh, here he is directing organ trafficking. I mean, he had a center which did this. Uh, he was given an award for, for doing this, and specifically for coming up with a new lethal injection method. He did thousands of transplants by his own admission in the award ceremony. He talks about that. SITNAC website stated, We need to give all of the thanks to the government for the support extended for our completing such a large number of organ transplants every year. This is a one of a kind in the world. Researchers were particularly struck by one aspect of these transplants. Unlike anywhere else in the world, they were being done on demand. In countries with advanced organ donation and allocation systems, patients must usually wait years for a donor to become available. Yet in China, waiting times are commonly in weeks. The 2006 Liver Transplant Registry report showed that 27% of samples were emergency transplants. That means they found a new liver within days or even hours. It was back in 2005 when a patient of mine 
who has been on the top list of patients for human heart transplantation, came to me one day and told me that he was told by his insurance company, his Israeli insurance company, to go to China in two weeks' time as he was scheduled to undergo heart transplantation. And when I asked him how come such a surgery can be scheduled ahead of time, you know, somebody has to die on the very day of the operation, he said he didn't know and he went to China and got his heart transplantation exactly on the day that he was promised. One hospital in southwest China claimed to have donors seeking matched recipients and also promised in case of failure, we will continue to perform transplants until one is successful. In 2006, a chief surgeon of the Organ Transplant Center at a traditional Chinese medicine hospital published a study of 50 patients at his hospital who had each received kidney transplants two, three, or four times. Another example that uh, I can't get out of my head is a man from a country who went twice to China. First time he went, they brought him four sets of, of kidneys, and none of the four was compatible with him. Three months, four months later, he came back, and they gave him, bought him four more sets of kidneys, until finally the eighth kidney worked, and uh, when we saw him, he was doing fine, but uh, eight human beings uh, have been killed. In northeastern China, the International Transplantation Network Assistance Center stated on its website, China carries out kidney transplants from living sources. It's completely different from cadaveric kidney transplants in Japan. Because they have a bank of live donors waiting to get a match on the computer. Some like, like some horrible restaurant where you go in and see a lobster and say, I want that lobster and the lobster's killed. It's a crime against humanity. The Chinese government claimed that the vast majority of organs came from death row prisoners and later donations. However, international organizations estimate that the number of death row executions at thousands each year since 2000 and decreasing. Chinese tradition requires that bodies remain whole after death. There was no organ donation system in China before 2010. Even today, there are very few donations. Therefore, these two sources combined account for only a tiny fraction of all transplants performed in China. China started performing transplants with organs harvested from executed prisoners at a small scale in the 70s. In the years that follow, it also started using organs from prisoners of conscience. In 1999, the crackdown of Falun Gong uh, starts. That is the largest action of scale uh, of the, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party since the Cultural Revolution. And by 2000, 2001, that's when you have this explosion in transplant activity. We see continuity in the numbers over time. The Falun Gong is a, as I call it, it's kind of a Buddhist revival group. It doesn't have churches and so forth, it doesn't have temples. Uh, what it has is sort of common beliefs. These shared beliefs revolve around self-improvement based on the values of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. By the end of the 1990s, the Chinese government estimated that over 70 million of its citizens were practicing Falun Gong. Jiang Zemin, the head of the Communist Party at the time, saw Falun Gong's popularity and revival of traditional values as a threat to his rule and launched a violent campaign to eradicate it in July 1999. Hundreds of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners from all over China traveled to Beijing to appeal to the central government, only to be arrested and tortured. When many refused to disclose their identities to protect their families and friends, they became part of a large, anonymous population held captive by the state. More practitioners were rounded up all across China. This is when large numbers of them started disappearing without a trace. The official line 
uh, in terms of repression of Falun Gong of the party is bankrupt them uh, financially, ruin their reputations, destroy them physically. So that uh, the vilification is destroying their reputations, the organ transplants is uh, destroying them physically. There's the physical examinations, the, the blood uh, testing, the organ examination, which have no other explanation than suitability for a transplant. It was like convert or, or die. Convert or die. Uh, turn in your friends or die. That it's state-sponsored genocide. As we did not expect after the Holocaust to see this kind of medical corruption come round again. How can doctors, people trained to heal, harvest organs from living people for transplants? Educated and raised in China, Enver Toti is an ethnic Uyghur surgeon, currently living in London. He was told to extract the organs from a living prisoner in 1995. They made you disabled to think yourself. My whole body just become a robot, just performed to do what I have been programmed to do. So anybody, if they label it themselves other than communism, the Communist Party or member, then they will be treated as an enemy of the state. Therefore, they are not even qualified as human being. And therefore, they are subject to whatever punishment is available. They made you genuinely believe what you are doing is the for, for a good cause. It is little later I realized I shortened this man's life. That is equal to a killer. I killed him. This thing is haunting me. I have to, to tell the world to release uh, the things inside my heart to get a little relief. In February 2017, Freedom House, an international human rights watchdog, published its own report on religion in China. It noted that a review of available information regarding organ transplants had found credible evidence suggesting that beginning in the early 2000s, Falun Gong detainees were killed for their organs on a large scale. It added that the large-scale disappearance of young Uyghur men accounts of routine blood testing of Uyghur political prisoners, and reports of mysterious deaths of Tibetans and Uyghurs in custody should raise alarm that these populations may also be victims of involuntary organ harvesting. I think, Gina, the first thing before you, you believe or you decide whether or not you want to believe is you have to learn the facts. The facts are there, the books are there, the research is there. Read it. Once you read it, I'm sure there will be no other way for you but to believe it. And we have to, we, I'm talking about the physician, have all to be together in order to stop it all immediately. Until 2005, we didn't have no law. I found out that Israeli insurance companies and HMOs have been providing reimbursement, full reimbursement for this transplant of Israelis who went to China and got these illegal organs. So together with my friends, we sat down with our parliament, the Knesset, and in 2008, the Israeli parliament has enacted the organ transplant law, which totally bans any reimbursement of illegally obtained organ transplantation anywhere around the world. And since then, not a single Israeli patient went anymore to China. In addition to Israel, Spain, Italy, and Taiwan, have passed laws restricting their citizens from traveling to China to receive an organ transplant from an illicit source. The systematic government-sponsored harvesting of organs is a monstrous crime. I strongly believe that the 17-year campaign to eradicate Falun Gong will be seen as one of the great shames of recent Chinese history. Since I've been a student of the Holocaust, uh, I, I feel that to a certain extent, 
what we're seeing is, is just a continuation of uh, what we uh, saw there in another form, which is the, the endless and bottomless depravity of human nature. I mean, there's no limit to the uh, form of evil that people can sink. When I was writing The Slaughter, I sometimes said, oh, I'm, I'm writing history, and then at the end of it, I realized I, I wasn't. It was actually still going on. This is a new form of genocide, and it's using the most respected members of society to implement it. This is one of the central tests of our time. We can't avoid this any longer.